Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here with us and welcome. Welcome to Raising Capital. Raising Capital is the first in a series of interventions that JBDC will initiate, dealing really with the business of financing, the business of appropriate financing, looking at financial products, looking at trends in the marketplace, looking at issues that you need to know about. Uh, we have an exciting evening planned and a robust panel uh, to discuss the issue, the matter this evening. Um, but before we go into that, I also have to mention that uh, welcome to our celebration of Global Entrepreneurship Week to get the proceedings on going. I'd like to invite our CEO, Valerie Vieira, to bring welcome, Ms. V. So welcome on behalf of the JBDC team and its partners, because we live by partnerships. And we have some special partners. I won't name everybody, but I must name my folks from Texas who are here in Washington, the OS team, who are here doing some partnership work with us to further our program. So special, special, special welcome to them but special welcome to all of you you notice what the setting is it's relaxing because we want to share it's a sharing experience it's not a talking presentation that kind of no vibes thing we at jbdc we are very excited about what we do we are even more excited about what we are going to do and we are absolutely thrilled as what is expected of us because we like to overachieve so you know that is a vibes thing that we're dealing with now this is the second um, major event for the week as harry said global entrepreneurial week where we celebrate entrepreneurship with the global marketplace so this is our jamaican part of it and the theme for the entire week for us is to empower invest and accelerate and i just want to add that we want to inform and inspire in that process and tonight, we are talking about financing without fear. And I won't give away what is going to be presented, but we want to move our, our clients from thinking that financing means taking the loan at a bank to something much more excited and creative and how you prepare yourself for that journey. So this is about sharing with some absolutely incredible people at our headspace, you know that it's a head table because that divides people. Our headspace, and they are going to be sharing on a number of issues. Well, like I said earlier, uh, we have a new unit in Jamaica Business Development Corporation, and that unit is called Financial Support Services Unit. We created the Financial Support Services Unit, FSSU, earlier this year out of the recognition that there exists a major gap in, in our financial literacy, um, in, our, in our financial preparedness as, as, as entrepreneurs, and in creating that, connecting the dots between where the money is and who needs the money. Um, there is a huge gap, no? And we recognize that there is need for focused attention um, to our entrepreneurs in this particular area, financial support. So what is FSU? FSSU is our first, our newly formed unit, not so you know again because we started in January, February of this year. I must say that our manager for the FSSU, Melissa Bennett, she is really beyond herself that she can't be here tonight. She had a baby two weeks ago. So we insisted that she stay home <laughs> tonight. She wanted to come, um, but, but she can't be here tonight. So Melissa is our manager for that unit. So it's aimed at building our MSME target group's capacity and preparing them to more effectively and efficiently navigate the existing financial market. Three main products 
of the FSSU. That first one is improving financial literacy, or three main pillars, I should say. First is improving financial literacy. The second is improving financial management. And the third has to do with facilitating access to finance. How will we improve financial literacy? Through providing financial information, articles, publications, etc., financial consultation um, at our office, at our client's office, wherever that needs, um, that consultation happens. And of course, to provide financial training, and this will be both face-to-face -face, face and webinars, etc., all different forms of training. Financial management, I remember I said the second pillar had to do with improving MSME's financial management. And we have introduced a financial hand-holding program, which is a systematic approach to assisting clients to implement best practice in financial um, management. And of course, that includes uh, analysis of and performance improvement, uh, compliance issues, uh, record keeping and, and, and reporting, systems deliver implementation, planning, and of course, continual assessment and helping persons to do that. In terms of the access to finance and facilitating access to finance, three main arms of that, accessing capital requirements and suitable funding options, preparing for funding, um, including key documentations like your business modeling, your business planning and things of that nature, your financial modeling and planning, and of course, referring MSMEs to our funding partners. And our expected outcome, of course, is effective financial management, um, increased business value, revenue enhancement, cost containment, and all these wonderful, lovely things that come with managing your, financial, um, your finances better. We have done a lot, and we, do, we plan to do this through um, strategic partnerships and through deliberate and strategic programs. Under financial literacy, we have partnered with the Mona School of Business, and um, we have presented a number of finance workshops to groups of professionals. Our first workshop had groups of lawyers and doctors um, at the Mona School of Business, and the program is called Financing Made Simple. Uh, you know, I, I must confess that I went to the first seminar, and I thought at first that the way the information was being presented was a little bit too simplistic because these were doctors who were in their practice for 30, 40 years and lawyers and surgeons and so on, having their business for many years. So I suggest, I asked an, an honest question at the break. I said, I mean, is this okay, guys? Are we going too, you know, low and way below where it should be? I said, no, 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 no. Actually, we could go a little lower. Um, financial literacy is a global issue. It doesn't matter what sector or what size business as well. It is a global problem for entrepreneurs. No? So we have partnered with the school, um, Mona School of Business for that. Uh, for our financial management program, which I spoke of earlier, we have a partnership pending with ICAJ, um, Institute of Chartered Accountants of Jamaica. And the idea is that with the partnership with ICAJ and Bruce and his team are very excited about it, we're going to utilize the chartered accountants across the island um, to partner with us to help clients in their hand-holding process, in the hand-holding process, helping them to prepare their books, helping them to do their record keeping, and so on, so that we have a bankable business every time. In terms of access to finance, again, we have partnered with a number of persons. Uh, we're going to sign an MOU this evening with First Angels. Uh, Sandra is here. We have partnership with NCB, strong, strong partnership with NCB from way back when. Um, we do a lot of work with Development Bank of Jamaica as well to provide appropriate access to finance. So, what we do and our program is really around strategic partnerships 
um, towards meeting the end that we hope to achieve. So that's a quick overview of what the FSSU is about. I invite you to visit our site, jbdc.net, and look at the information, understand what we're about, and call us, give us a call. At this time, we're going to have a signing of the MOU with ourselves and First Angels, and I want to invite our CEO, Val Rivera, and uh, partner and founding, founding partner and manager of First Angels to the podium. Can you give them a round of applause while they come? And when Sandra uh, gets to the podium later and explains to you what First Angels is about, if you don't know, you'll understand the significance of this MOU signing right here. Give them a round of applause, please. This time I want to invite Althea Westmeyers. Now, Althea is the manager of our business advisory services team. Um, and Althea is going to tell you about and share with you a new program. You notice how many JBDC is, is one thing that we do is that we never stay static because the client and the client's need needs never stay static either. So we have to be evolving and changing and, and, and developing new projects and programs to meet the needs of our client. And Althea is going to tell you briefly about our accelerator program that we'll be launching soon. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Now, JBDC has, for some time, operated a very structured program of development for entrepreneurs in a very guided development plan that is informed by gaps in the operations of our entrepreneurs, by what's happening in the ecosystem, by trends in particular industries. We use that to more or less develop a program that our clients can use as individuals. Now, our existing program of incubation currently includes over 200 enterprises receiving assistance through our business monitoring program. Now, today we take the opportunity to give you some insight into our our next big step, and that is the launch of our accelerator program. Now, facilitation of entrepreneurial success is predicated on four major pillars, and that's the, the person behind the business. I always tell people I interact with that when they, when they ask, for example, what is usually the biggest reason for business failure, and I say more often than not, you'll not, you'll not find it in a textbook, but more often than not, it is the person behind the business. So we are very invested in developing the entrepreneurs themselves and helping them to inculcate as a part of their, their being the entrepreneurial mindset. So that is a, a pillar on which we predicate the success of our accelerator. Also, the, the, the development of markets, you know, facilitating movements in the domestic market, but global market development, creating pathways to capital for entrepreneurs as well as giving them a sound networking facility. Now, our target, of course, is high growth potential entrepreneurs. Notice I didn't say high growth entrepreneurs, but high growth potential, because we are in the, in the business of seeking, finding out those entrepreneurs, going out into the marketplace, attracting them, seeking for them, because we know that there is potential that is as yet unexplored in the Jamaican marketplace. We, we hear all the time the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor tells us that Jamaica is probably the fourth most entrepreneurial nation in the world. And we're not seeing it, we're not seeing it in terms of the, the GDP results that we want to see. So we believe that if we go, go out and search for that and harness that, it's critical to the success not only of entrepreneurs but as the nation as a whole. Now, the, the model or, or accelerator model is different. I, I know that there are a number of accelerators across Jamaica now. We, we, we hear of Startup Jamaica, we know of Branson Center. We know of several other accelerators. And you probably would ask, what is it that is going to make this accelerator different? What is it that distinguishes us from what's existing in the marketplace? And we are saying it is a comprehensive suite of business development services that is available only together 
at JBDC. Nowhere else in Jamaica can you find a comprehensive um, suite of business development services. Let me give you an example. The, the average accelerator, whether here or across the world, will help an entrepreneur on the business development side. And they will have to seek, so for example, uh, uh, maybe Mrs. Glasgow, Sandra Glasgow can, can, can attest to this. Quite a number of times, persons are prepared and they get to the stage where they're giving a pitch, but the product itself is not market ready. It has not been market tested, it has not been screened, they have done no customer development. So what we are, what we are offering at our accelerator is a balance of both. So before you get to the stage where you're pitching in front of an investor, you would have had a product that has been screened, that has been market tested. We would have helped you to prepare a minimum viable product, some kind of prototyping that you're going to take to the marketplace. We would take, use our research unit to help you to develop that minimum research product, have the product tested on the market, bring it back, do the necessary pivoting on the business model assumptions that you have made, and prepare you properly on both sides, product development side as well as customer development side in leading into business development, full blown. And that is, that is where it's different at JBDC because we are, we, are, we are creating the balance that does not exist in other accelerators. Now what's the unfair advantage offered in this accelerator? Obviously, well, everybody offers coaching support. We're offering you access to cap capital, meaning you, you just saw the MOU being signed with First Angels. What we're saying is that we are serious about this thing. This accelerator is the medium through which you get to the place where you're pitching before First Angels. You're being properly prepared. It's a six month program, six month detailed curriculum. It, it, it offers you mentorship, connectivity, workspace. We have an executive in residence program, advisors in residence, a black box, box of support systems, access to professional bro pro bono services, all of that. All right, so um, how do you get, when we're not ready to launch, we'll be launching in the next quarter, but how do you get there? Of course, there'll be a rigorous selection process. We're gonna be doing most of it online, an online filter for a cohort intake of 20 persons. You must, of course, meet the evaluation criteria and agree to some branding stipulations and allow us to take some en program entry metrics at the beginning. As I said, it's a six month program there are going to be mentors, there's going to be business model testing and validation, helping you to create a minimum viable product, preparation for accessing funding. We'll be having startup weekends, boot camp trainings, networking events, and obviously preparation for pitch at the end. Now, graduation, you're going to be either doing a pitch before angel investors or a demo day. We'll be taking metrics at the end of the program, and you'll be required to allow us to do evaluation of up to two years after the program, after you've exited the accelerator. Now, how will we measure our success? We're going to be looking at success in two, in two areas, client outcomes as well as JBDC outcomes. So for clients, we're going to be looking at track your traction, number of early users, early adopters to your product. We're looking at your increase in sales or revenue. We're also looking at amount of matched funding with angel investors. We're looking at the new markets that you've entered and any kind of international pattern or evidence. For JBDC, as ourselves, we really have to be responsive in our approach. So we have to take metrics for ourselves. We're looking at the number of clients accessing the funding and the amount of funding we have provided access to, number of clients entering new markets, number of business models that we've validated, the degree of scaling during and after the program close, and the expansion of the sector. All right, that's, that's about sum, sums it up, but I, I hope it gives fodder for your questions. I hope it gives you something to think about, and you can always speak with me after. We are excited to allow access to this program and to, to participate further in the development of the entrepreneurial sector in Jamaica. Okay. Another round of applause for Althea, because I mean, a lot of work has, has gone into it, a lot of thinking, a lot of strategizing, and so on. And, um, Look for us in the next quarter. We're going to be rolling this out in earnest, and you'll hear much, much more about this. So, is that, a, is that time of evening where I want to uh, uh, introduce my um, star studded panel, Miss Audrey Richards? And Audrey is the program coordinator for 
Jamaica Venture Capital Program at Development Bank of Jamaica. Can you make her feel welcome? Just give her a round of applause. To her right this evening, she's representing First Angels Jamaica, Sandra Glasgow. <laughs> Beside Sandra, we have Mr. Carl Townsend, Chief Country Officer, Jamaica Group, Capital Markets, JMMB. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Beside Carl, as our partner from NCB, um, from the other side of NCB, and I want to big up Audrey. Where, where are you, Audrey? Togwell, Henry, <laughs> from NCB, who um, has worked very closely with us for a long time. But from another area of NCB, Mr. Herbert Hall, he's the Assistant Vice President, Investment Banking at NCB. Herbert, give him a round of applause, please. And at the end, Long-time partner as well. We do a lot of work with the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Um, we have Mr. Robin Levy. He's a Deputy General Manager, Jamaica Stock Exchange, Equity Capital Markets. Robin, give him a round of applause. So may I invite, first up, Ms. Audrey Richards from DBJ. Audrey. Good evening, everybody. It's really great to be here this evening, and I want to congratulate JBDC on the activities, all the activities for this week. And I'm particularly pleased um, about the, the FSSU because a few years ago, um, nobody was talking about MVPs. Nobody was talking about lean startups or pitching or venture forums or pivoting or you know, all of that stuff. Angel investment was something that maybe you might have seen on Shark Tank or something. So know that I think we have come a long way. Yeah. Um, that's the good news. The not so good news is that there is still a heck of a lot of work left to be done. So we still have much, much further to go. But I think what JBDC has done and what they're doing when it comes to setting up the FSSU um, it's, it's great because it's a great start. At the Development Bank of Jamaica, when, they looked, when we looked at establishing uh, the ecosystem for venture capital, well, first of all, the venture capital program was, um, was looked at coming out of the, the DBJ's mandate um, when it came to access to finance. That's definitely one of the pillars um, on which the strategies that DBJ deploys um, employees in Jamaica is really built. And uh, what, we, what we found was that, yes, there, were ish there was debt financing and there were constraints where that was concerned, but there was absolutely um, very, very few opportunities, if, if I mean, practically none, um, where equity financing was concerned. Um, venture capital was definitely an area of private equity, which is really, venture capital can be considered um, a lot of people use them interchangeably, but venture capital really, really relates to funding for early stage companies, um, whereas private equity, which is really the asset class, really relates to the, the entire asset class. So you could say that venture capital is a subset of private equity, um, but when we speak about private equity, we're usually talking about the bigger companies, the more established entities. So what we recognized was that there was the venture, the, the stock exchange was there and you had a number of listed companies. Um, the junior stock exchange was just coming on and there were a number of new companies. Access Finance was one of the first companies that came on the junior stock exchange. Um, but what you found is that Access Finance, like a number of companies which eventually listed, they would have gotten some kind of risk capital Somebody took a, took, a, took, a, took, a, took a risk when they invested in access finance. Um, and eventually, the company got enough traction to be on the exchange. Similarly, JMB, as Harold just mentioned, um, I like to tell the story that um, I worked with Joan Duncan, who founded JMB in my early days just out of business school. And uh, JMB was started uh, in um, an office down on Ocean Boulevard, probably half the size of this patio area. And it was one of the first fun, it was one of the only success stories out of one of Jamaica's only venture capital funds that was started in the early 90s. 
um, and that was Jamaica Venture Fund. So JMMB, which is now a regional powerhouse, came out of the venture cap out of funding out of a venture capital company. But between JMMB and uh, the late and say you know the, the 2010 and 2011 when we we looked at um, the whole issue of venture capital. There was only one other private equity firm that had started in that in those um, 20 odd years. So we had to, to go back to basis. It was not just about raising capital. It was not just about mobilizing a lot of funding from investors and then put in, trying to find um, companies in which to put it in. Uh, we had to go back to basics, as I said, and look, we want to be able to consummate deals, meaning an investor, an entrepreneur, and there's a deal made where an investment is made in the entrepreneur's company. But like any other market where deals are made, it doesn't just happen just so. The investor has to be knowledgeable and prepared, and the entrepreneur, on the other hand, also has to be ready. Um, we, the, the, the narrative that we get from a lot of entrepreneurs is, I have, a, I have a great idea and nobody wants to fund me. But nobody's going to necessarily fund you, your idea, maybe your mother, your father, a good friend, which is why they say one of the first set of, um, the first um, bit of capital that an entrepreneur gets is usually from the three Fs, the full friends and family. So no, no bank is going to fund you. Um, a serious investor like Sandra over there, the rock star, Wants a, little, <laughs> wants a little bit more than just your idea. So when JBDC is doing what it's doing now in terms of the kind of support, guidance, coaching that they're giving to entrepreneurs, this is what was missing out of the market. So when we decided to, to build an, um, a venture capital industry in Jamaica, as I said, we had to go back to basics and said, okay, there's a market. Who are the suppliers? Who, are they, who is demanding? And what is the environment? We compared where we were in Jamaica to what is happening in other countries, countries with successful venture capital or private equity markets. And we we're able to identify that there were a number of gaps in our ecosystem. Um, there were knowledge gaps. There were gaps when it came to, when I said knowledge gaps, nobody understood what it, what it meant to be getting venture capital funding or private equity funding. The investors didn't understand, neither did the entrepreneurs. So there was no way that we're ever going to get venture capital moving in this country. Um, on the other hand, there was an information gap. There were one or two um, funds that we were aware of but nobody knew who, were they, who they were, nobody knew who, who was actually you know, making investments. And uh, you know, there was just that, that major gap um, that nobody knew. <laughs> nobody knew where to go, what to do, who to get anything from. Um, and again, entrepreneurs, even if yet they found an in, a potential investor, they didn't have a proper business model, they didn't have a, um, they didn't have, they didn't know how to pitch their business. So, you know, there was a knowledge, there was an information gap. The entrepreneurs, as I, as I, as I, as I mentioned previously, um, they were not ready. The entrepreneurs, there is no funding, there's no one source of funding that is going to satisfy every entrepreneur. Meaning that if you're just start, your startup, you're an existing company, an established company that maybe needs some restructuring in order to take on new markets, new products, and so on. You are in a different market for funds. Um, both, uh, both sets of entrepreneurs are in a different market for funds. So it makes no sense approaching a private equity investor who is looking for big deals, doing, looking to do a buyout, looking to restructure if you're not that person. So again, you know, there was that disconnect. Um, there was a disconnect when it came to our legal and regulatory framework in that most, a lot of funding for this asset class comes out of places like the pension funds. And in Jamaica, our pension fund regulations um, 
well, it's, it's, it's a big debate, but our pension fund regulations lack clarity. So pension funds were not going to be investing in this asset class. And of course, there was no institu the institutional investors and so on. Um, the, most of them were just out of the market and individual investors didn't know what to do. So where we are today, I would say we have done quite a bit. We have done, um, we set out to, to undertake different initiatives in order to close these gaps. And when I say close these gaps, a lot of the gaps really stemmed from gaps when it came to human capital. Yes, there were the environmental gaps in terms of support services, which is what like the JBDC is offering now. But the human capital, that was a major gap. So a lot of the work that we've done over the last couple of years has really um, focused on uh, development of the human capital, training of entrepreneurs. We've had three international conferences um, where we have brought in different speakers who would be able to network with entrepreneurs, investors, and so on. Um, we have trained attorneys. We established a, a, you know, a standardized um, documentation um, and agreements that somebody can use in order to undertake a, a venture capital um, investment um, transaction. So we had to train the, 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 the lawyers because most lawyers they might have read it in a textbook, but most of them would never have known what a term sheet, you know, how to deal with that. So basically, um, what we have done is also, when we looked at the universities, a lot of the new ideas, the innovation, and so on, came out of universities in other countries. Um, Stanford University and Berkeley were some of the sources, the hubs, for Silicon Valley's entrepreneurs. So we've, we, we started um, a national business model competition, um, and it's now in its fourth year, and in that time, we've impacted the lives of about, I would say, more than 800 students who now understand what it takes to move their idea, to develop a business model around their idea, test their markets, and be able to make a pitch. So we think we have come a long way, and we think we have touched the lives of a few thousand people. Um, we're building an industry in Jamaica, not just for Jamaica, but we want to see Jamaica as a major hub for entrepreneur, entre entrepreneurship and investments in the Caribbean and in the region. So our sites are not just local, our sites are regional and eventually global. So that's where we are, which is why I said I'm very excited because I've seen the paradigm shift that has taken place. And we have to know, we know that it's not just about the government doing it. it we've always gone lockstep with the private sector. And I think that's where we're moving to. We continue to move to. So when the private sector took hold of things and set up their angel networks, when there are new funds that have already started, then we know that we're on the right track. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I could not have received this invitation and, and not come here to represent the Jamaica Stock Exchange. We are a proud partner of JBDC. I was wondering if you're going to mention the MOU you have with us. So you mentioned just about everybody else. So I, I was glad when you actually mentioned, when you introduced me, you mentioned our partnership. But we also have a, an MOU with JBDC for the development of um, skills and financial literacy um, to, for companies hoping to list on the stock exchange. Now, how many persons here by a show of hands have heard of the Jamaica Stock Exchange junior market? Just about everybody. All right, great. So when I hear Audrey talk about how far the ecosystem has come for venture capital, for small and micro and medium-sized businesses, um, I have to say, job well done. Job well done. Not only by the work being done by DBJ and JBDC and others, but it's been a number of players from all different sectors who have come together. Well, they haven't always come together. Sometimes they've worked at cross purposes, they've worked in isolation of each other, but somehow we have come to a place where it is possible for entrepreneurs, small, medium-sized businesses who want to grow and develop to find funding in Jamaica. As a prime example of this, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, over $22.5 billion has been raised in the last five years. 
to fund companies that have come to the exchange to raise capital. Good evening, everybody. It's really great to be here, and I want to also add my words of congratulations to the JBDC um, for the events of Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, as you can see, I have gray hair, so I'm the veteran in the entrepreneurship development space. Um, in 1987, I started an entrepreneurial center at CAST, which, was, which is now the University of Technology, Jamaica, and founded Jamaica's first technology business incubator, the Technology Innovation Center. You know, it's interesting. I was um, in New York this past weekend um, attending a meeting of uh, the Eisenhower Fellows. I was a fellow in 2000. I spent eight weeks in the U.S. Uh, looking at venture capital funds, at angel investor networks, at incubators, and accelerators were just about being thought about at the time. But now, it's like all the stars have aligned, and I am excited that two years ago, we uh, a group of investors, um, Joe Matalon, JJ G. Wax, and myself, took the plunge and just started this angel investor network called First Angels, JA. After two years, we have over 240 applicants on our platform. We have had 11 pitch events. We have invested in four companies. Um, and uh, we have a uh, created a very robust pipeline for deals. But, you know, an angel investor network must have a robust pipeline. And if we are not working with our entrepreneurs to get them ready, get them investment ready, then we, we won't have companies to invest in. And I want to underscore a point that Robin made, because there is no shortage of capital in Jamaica. I want to assure all of you who are here. Um, I had prepared a, a, a presentation and just to show you a graphic um, of what the financing cycle looks like. Because there are a lot of people who curse the banks and say, I want to start a business. The banks won't lend me money. The truth is that the banks are not really in the space to lend to startups and early stage companies. That belongs to the four Fs, Audrey talks about the founders, friends, family, and the fools, um, and angel investors. So I just want to have a little quick conversation with you um, about what angel investing is all about and what First Angels does. Can somebody tell me the difference between debt and equity financing? So there are some fundamental differences. Of course, you know, you borrow the money from the bank, by the end of the month, Audrey is there, she can attest to it, um, you, have, you owe them money, right? Um, you owe them maybe some of the principal and the interest, and you would have had to have put down lots of things, um, put some cash, or there's some unsecured too, but uh, there's some unsecured lending, but you have to prove yourself, Audrey, before I, not even I get unsecured lending, and I'm a director of your bank. So... <laughs> <laughs> right? But there is unsecured lending. But generally, you have to certainly pay it back. Equity funding is not something you are going to pay back. The agents are going to invest money in your business because they are expecting some significant returns down the road. And it could be as far along as five to even ten years. But they are going to expect that this business is going to be able to provide the returns. So you have to have a business that demonstrates to them that it will grow sufficiently for them to get their money back. And, and they will get their money back when you sell shares to a third party or you list on a stock exchange, right? Um, but there are also some, some other differences. Um, in that one of the things is that angels will invest the money, but they could actually lose it all. So they're taking a big risk when they invest in you. And, and the way it works is that angels invest in a portfolio of companies. So they might invest in 10 companies and hope that one or two of them are going to do 
fabulously well and give them 10, 20, 100 times their original investment. So let me just say a little bit about First Angels. Um, I said we started two years ago in July 2014. We have 30 members today. Um, and we invest in businesses. There's no particular industry that we invest in. Um, we are really looking for businesses with a, a strong leader, somebody who, an entrepreneur, who is a visionary. Maybe you haven't run a business before, but you are demonstrating some capabilities, um, some characteristics that tells us that, hey, this person is really um, out to succeed. They have a good business model, a good, you know, you might have a 10-page business plan, but it makes sense. You have a team behind you. That's very important that you have a team behind you. But that you have a vision for the growth of this company that's going to make it a significant player. So if you're thinking about a, a corner shop that's going to stay the same size for the next 20 years, you're probably not the kind of business that we would like to see. We have pitch events every other month. In fact, we have one um, on Friday. And generally at our pitch events, we see two um, companies. We have a platform, so if you go to our website, firstangelsja.com, you can apply. And interestingly, of the two, I think at the end of October, we had 239 applicants on our website, but only, seven, only 84 of them had actually completed the application. So it does require that you have the information um, that will give us a sense of what this business is, what its prospects are, who you are, how much money you need, and how much you are going to give up, um, how many shares you're going to give up in return for the equity. We have no limit to how much you can ask for. Our investments have run from 45,000 US dollars, about 5 million Jamaican dollars, to 23 million Jamaican dollars. So, and, and every day we are getting um, requests of all kinds of levels. I, I think I will leave it at that for now, and then we can expand in the discussion and the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, I too must add, um, on behalf of NCB and NCB Capital Markets, um, our gratitude to be here and to congratulate you on on um, a job well done in um, helping to develop the ecosystem um, for SMEs and, and entrepreneurs generally. One of the benefits of speaking behind um, such erudite persons is that they essentially would have done most or not all of the work for me already, right? So I'm going to be brief. One of the things that um, Audrey mentioned earlier is the fact that not all types of um, private equity is for the different types of businesses. In other words, um, there are businesses at, at their initial stages which would require certain different types of investments and investors. No, I won't go into that, but the FFFs were mentioned, um, the angels were mentioned, the, um, the, the private equity was also mentioned. And um, my duty is to just sort of zoom in a little bit on the private equity. Now, the private equity um, investor comes in a little bit further down the life cycle of a business. So there is actually a business life cycle. And um, typically, the private equity investor would come a little bit further down in the life stage of the, uh, of the, of the business. Now, the private equity investor typically wants to see a couple of things. Um, they would want to see, for example, that you have a good business plan, right? Um, they would want to see that, and that business plan, of course, would include a number of things, right? Um, what your business is all about, the size of the opportunity and the market that you're targeting. Um, do you have a marketing plan? And I suspect the JBDC would help um, investors, sorry, entrepreneurs on the, on, the, on the shorter side of the spectrum to come up with these. But 
typically we would have expected the, um, the company who is in need of uh, private equity financing to already have these things in place. Now, the question is, is there the requisite expertise to drive the business? And many a times, um, the answer may be no. And as such, you may need to, um, to consult with a, a, a business advisor to sort of get certain things going. And um, I must also say that we do also have a partnership <laughs> with Business Tactic <laughs> and Sandra Glasgow. So in the entire um, ecosystem, we are partnering, right? Now, the other thing that I would want to, to mention is whether or not there's a compelling um, story for the use of proceeds and the return potential, right? Um, equity financing is not, and I repeat, is not free, right? Equity financing is not free. Um, it is arguable that it's probably the most costly Right? Because you're actually giving up a part of your business. Right? And um, investors, for taking on that risk, albeit later on in the, in the life cycle of the business, is still a risk that you're taking on. Right? And they need to be compensated um, for that risk. And typically that compensation is over and above what people regard as a risk-free rate, which is essentially rates, for example, that um, the government of Jamaica would offer. Right? So there's a premium um, on top of that. Otherwise, the investor would say, hey, why am I taking on this additional risk if I'm not being compensated? So there has to be that compelling use of proceeds. Um, are you going to expand? Are you going to re-capitalize um, the business so that you can um, retool and so on? Is it that you are going to concentrate on, uh, on um, product development, that sort of thing. Now, very importantly, um, there has to be governance, a governance framework in place, right? And that governance framework would necessarily need to speak to um, how you conduct your affairs. Um, do you have a good board of directors in place? Are these directors um, experienced in the various different facets that will require um, the guidance to navigate um, whatever business. So for example, do you have a good accountant on your board? Do you have a good lawyer on your board? Um, do you have persons from, from, from the requisite field to give you some guidance? Um, that sort of thing. Um, do you have, for example, one of the, the requirements of the, the, the stock exchange um, is that you need to have a compensation committee or an audit committee. Do you have those things in place? If not, then probably now is a good time. If you are on this spectrum um, or maturity in the business to contemplate those things. Now, a private equity investor, unfortunately, is not in your business forever, right? They are investors and like everything, every good thing, there must be an ending. Right, I'm not quite at my ending as yet. But they need, they need to know what their exit is going to be. And pretty much, where is Robin? Oh, he's gone, okay. The stock exchange, <laughs> I'm glad that he has left, right? The stock exchange is pretty much um, one of the ways that you can exit, but not the only way. You can also find other investors who are like-minded and want to be a part of that company to take over, right? Take over your, your, your share. Um, so you have, you can sell to existing or new shareholders or do an IPO, which is really desired, the desired exit. Because at that point in time, you will know the valuation of your company. You will be able to broaden your, 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 your investor base and perhaps put you in a better stead to get additional funding later on, for example, from Audrey. Right? So there is a space um, in the capital structure um, for, for, for equity and for debt. And don't be alarmed by the use of the capital structure. It just says how you finance your business, whether you use debt or equity or a combination of both, right? Now, there are a couple of things that I want to, 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 to um, zoom in on. And it is essentially good that, Sandra, you spoke earlier, right? Um, because there are some mindset myths that 
that entrepreneurs have, and Sandra spoke to some of them, right? Um, one of them that I like to talk about is entrepreneurs are their own bosses and completely independent. That's not so, right? You, you have a number of persons, right? You serve many, many masters, right? Including your partners. If you have investors who came in in the early stage, right? You have to also serve them. You supply goods to suppliers, to consumers, right? They are also a part of um, your, your, um, your, your sphere. Your suppliers, your creditors, your employees, right? It is really difficult and rare, and perhaps I've never really seen, um, where a, build, uh, a, a business is built with great scale and scope single-handedly. You have to have partnerships, right? So that is one. Um, the other one is, and it sort of zooms in a little bit, um, or dovetails a little bit from that one, is that you are lone wolves and can't work with others, right? That is not so. That's a myth that needs to be dispelled. Because most successful entrepreneurs, if you think about them, they are leaders who build great teams and effective relationships and work with peers, directors, investors, key customers and suppliers. And you can give some example. Um, Warren Buffett, Michael Lee Chin, Sir Richard Branson, um, R. Danny Williams, our own Joan Duncan, Honorable Desmond Blades. Um, did I hear the president-elect? I don't know. Um, probably not. But even he has a team, right? And um, recognizes these. Um, the other one that I hear a lot of um, entrepreneurs' company talk about is, boy, I don't want to give up control of my company, right? Um, so that's the other myth. Entrepreneurs want the whole show to keep for themselves. Um, I always say that 100% of 10 is how much? 100% of 10 is how much? 10. 50% of 100 is how much? 50. Simple maths, right? You alone, I mean, with your own, with your own wherewithal. If you, if, if you concentrate on just you um, and not involve other persons to, to drive value in the business, to, to invest in the business, you'll always be at that 10, right? If you decide that after the end of my presentation that you want to invest, then you'll have investors putting in some money. Of course, you may lose a part of the company. You don't have to lose control. But then you would have increased the value being created in the company, right? Um, so this mindset sort of limits growth. It robs the business of needed skills and expertise and the unwillingness to bring on partners because of fear of losing control, right? Now, in that example that, that I just used, simplistic, but if you just really reflect on it, right, it's essentially a 400% increase. Simple, right? Now, I wanted to now just talk briefly on, on the process, right, for, for, you know, companies that are at that, that level and what you'd want. Um, so, what's the expectation? So, it simply starts with a consultation advisory, right? What it is that you want, what are your aims, your objectives, right, in terms of the use of funds. Remember, I spoke about the compelling reason for the use of funds, right? Then a due diligence process is, is conducted. Essentially, um, we require the company information, financials, and, of course, business plan, et cetera. I mean, there is very little that you can do without having your business plan, there's very little that you can do without having your financials. Even if you are at the very start, um, a year or two years into operation, start putting your accounts in order. Very important, right? I know, is there anybody from the tax department here? Okay, so, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> no, 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 so it is very important. It is absolutely critical. It's absolutely critical for you to keep good books, right? If you want to rob the tax money, also robbing yourself in the long run because nobody, no entity is going to look on a company that doesn't have proper financials that can stand scrutiny, right? Now, another aspect 
um, that, that um, we normally talk about in the, in the private equity space is valuation of the business. And this is where the rubber really hits the road, right? Um, how much the business is, value, is valued? Um, unfortunately, there's always um, a disconnect uh, between what the entrepreneur thinks his business is worth versus an advisor looking on in or what the market will value your business, right? And my theory for that is that there is an emotional premium that is put on the business, right? Um, and many a times, um, the valuation process, um, there is a technique to get in a valuation. Um, people don't just pick a number out of a hat. There's actually a technique um, to get to a valuation. So you sit with an entity, a capable entity, such as NCB Capital Markets, and we can guide you on that, right? Um, but that is very important, and I, and I, thought, it, I thought it necessary to just um, sensitize you that the valuation process is very important, and there are a number of ways of, of doing valuation, right? The other thing is the documentation. Um, you're going through that process, the registration of the offer, consultation with the various statutory organizations such as the FSC, Company of Jamaica, and JSE. I see that my time has drawn to a close, so there's just two things, two other things in the process, and that is, um, the equity positioning and the underwriting, right? And underwriting is essentially where an organization um, such as ours, again, will take a position before you even go to the market to, to ensure that you get the amount of capital or, or, or funding that you want. And the last thing is you launch the offer, you get your money, and we close. And we say thank you very, very much. Thanks to the JBDC for extending an invitation to JMMB and, and by extension myself to participate in this forum. We want to also add our congratulations um, for what you've been doing. You've been doing a really great job in getting entrepreneurs ready for accessing the capital markets, whether it's debt or equity or any hybrid in between, but it's very important. There is a process as you mentioned. Um, of course, I have to put in a plug for JMMB, because you know, Audrey didn't give me a plug, so I'm going to give myself a plug, which is that in developing the venture capital ecosystem, JMMB was actually one of the founding sponsors. We actually put some money in the thing, and we sponsored some things, and we're part of the steering committee and all those wonderful things, right, Audrey? So, you know, we actually put some money in there. Um, and as far as First Angel goes, again, Sandra didn't give us a plug, but we're going to give ourselves a plug. We are one of the members of the First Angels Network. So you can see that at JMB, we put our money where our collective mouths are. All right. So JBDC has asked me to speak a little bit about mezzanine financing. So I'll, I'll try my best. And um, if my best isn't good enough, please keep the eggs down on that side um, until I leave. Then you can you know, throw them on this side. So what is mezzanine finance? Um, Mez finance, as we, we call it in the trade, is typically any kind of subordinated debt or preferred equity instrument. And don't worry, I'm going to explain what those are in a minute. Um, and that those typically represent a claim on a company's assets, which is senior only to that of the common shares or the ordinary shares of the company. And Mez finance is typically a hybrid of debt and equity, and sometimes gives the lender the rights to convert to an ownership or equity interest in the company in case of default. And depending on the structure and the covenants, it can be treated like equity on a company's balance sheet. And, you know, I will say typically a lot of times because, you know, in this business, it's never black or white, and it's usually not even shades of gray. You know, it's just shades of whatever you want it to be. And that's the beauty of structuring. Um, in the capital markets, you, you have the full flexibility to, to get what you actually want. You know, you can be as flexible as you want to be. So as I said before, MES can be structured either as debt, and that debt, you know, can be unsecured or secured subordinated notes or preferred equity. It's typically a usually more expensive form of financing for a company than senior debt or a secure debt. And the higher cost of capital associated with MES finance is a result of it typically being unsecured 
or subordinated mean that it's junior to senior debt. And what we mean by that is, you know, you heard both Sandra and, and Herbie speaking about the life cycle and the different types of debt. So if you think about as a company, you go to a bank, so you want to raise money, say you want $10 million for argument's sake. Most persons' first option is to go to a bank. And I don't want to knock banks because that's where I grew up. You know, I, I grew up in corporate and commercial banking. But you go to a bank, and what the bank will usually say is that if they like what you have to say, they will lend you the money, but they want collateral. And the reason why they want collateral is if you default, that's something that they can realize to get back the depositor's money. Because what a lot of you don't know is that what the banks lend out a lot of times is depositor's money. It's not their money. So they have to make sure that it's properly secured and it's properly governed. And of course, the Bank of Jamaica is looking over their shoulder. So with MES Finance, they're coming in below banks or any other form of secure debt. And so what they're saying is if we are going to lend you this money, we don't have any collateral behind it, we are hoping that you do what you say you're going to do and they're able to pay us, but we are taking a risk because if the business goes belly up, then we don't have any collateral to claim on, right? Um, some of the times they can't even sue because it really makes no sense. So they're going to charge your premium to do that. Um, and that premium, as I said, is higher than what the senior lenders would charge, but typically a little lower than what Herbie's going to charge you for private equity. So, you know, somewhere in between there. Um, it, mass financing also involves a greater amount of leverage. And what do we mean by leverage? Leverage just means if you look at all the loans that you have compared to your equity, that's what we really call leverage. So the more loans you have compared to your equity, the more levered you are. And the less loans you have compared to your equity, is the less levered you are. You know, it's as simple as it gets. Um, more leverage, of course, means more risk. So you might have heard people talking about de-risking. I really all that means is, you know, people want to get rid of leverage, lower their leverage ratios, and increase the equity ratios. And of course, you can do that in a number of different ways. So of course, MES, MES lenders um, want compensation for taking on that increased risk. And so they always require a higher return for their investment than secured or senior lenders. Now, you've heard this before, but I'll say it again. And you know what we say in Jamaica, right? If, if you hear it one time, eh, it might not be so. But if you hear it two or three times, it typically means it's true. To attract mass financing, like any other type of financing, the company must demonstrate a track record um, in its industry, establish reputation on products, and most importantly, a history of profitability, or almost guaranteed revenues and profits in the case of new businesses. And what do I mean by that? So, if you have an established business and you, you're keeping proper books of account, and the tax authorities are happy with you, so they're not knocking at your door, and your auditors have given you a clean bill of health, and you can show that to a potential mess financier, um, and they will look at that and say, okay, so your business has been profitable for X number of years, it is growing, and part of the reason why you need this mess funding is because you're growing so much, you can't get any more funding from the banks, you don't necessarily want to go to venture capital or private equity at this point. You know, you want some money to get you to where you want to be so that when you go and speak to private equity persons, private equity investors, you can get the kind of valuation that you're looking for. So you have to demonstrate that your business is profitable. And the big reason for that is profits are what you use to repay loans, right? So if your business is profitable, you can say, well, I'm generating cash flow, and that cash flow is what I'm going to use to repay you until we have some other kind of exit strategy, whether it's an IPO or a private equity investor or so on. However, sometimes what happens is you have a great business model. You haven't necessarily started to generate cash as yet, but you can demonstrate that this business will work. All the things are lined up. So maybe it is that you have a patent that you have a lot of people have signed up to pay you fees for using your patent, or it is that you have a niche um, that, that consumers or businesses have said they will use your product, and you can evidence that by signing contracts with people, or it is that what you're doing, you actually have contracts in place already, 
and basically all you need now is funding to execute. If you have those sort of things, even if you haven't started to generate the cash as yet, you can sometimes get mess financing to help you to get there because you can evidence in a big way that these cash flows are assured. I have contracts in place, I have my patents, I have all my legal work done, everything is ready to go. I have people who are ready to buy. I just need the money now to build the product or distribute the product or whatever it is that you need the money for. So that is another way, even if you haven't started to generate cash as yet. Um, and of course, when you talk to your mes potential MES lenders, you have to demonstrate to them that the business will generate the cash to repay this MES loan, or that your exit strategy is to go to private equity investors who will buy a share of the company and give you cash that will pay out the MES funding, or you're going to do an IPO that will pay out the MES funding, or you want to just generate cash that will continue to pay and the MES funding is for a specific period of time, so it's a structured MES arrangement, which means that you're going to have this MES funding for say five years or six years or seven years, and you're generating enough cash over those seven years to repay the MES loan. You know, that is something else um, that you can look at. MES, MES lenders are typically specialist mezzanine investment funds. So what that means is, typically when you find persons who are doing MES funding, they generally have a fund. So this is kind of their modus operandi. This is their business. So they are looking for companies who want MES funding, and they are saying we will provide it. We have set up a pool of money to do just that, to provide MES funding. And they have their business model, they'll say what their hurdle rate is, and hurdle rate just means what is their rate of return that they are looking for, what are the type of businesses that they want to invest in, what are the things that the company must demonstrate and evidence to them in order to get their money. And of course, they'll give you a term sheet, and you can you know, look at that. If you find it satisfactory, then you can go and um, take advantage of the MES funding. Now, in terms of MES, one of the things about MES that is very different from, say, a bank loan is that MES funding can be a lot more flexible than a typical bank loan. Because MES financiers recognize that one size doesn't fit all for these type of businesses that they're looking to fund. So, for instance, um, the rate of return that a MES lender is looking for can come from anyone or a combination of the following types of things. And let's run through them very quickly. So you have cash interest. That one is fairly straightforward. It's a periodic payment of cash based on a percentage of the outstanding balance of the mezzanine financing. The interest rate for that MES loan can either be fixed for the life or floating. And uh, when we say floating, it means it's pegged to some transparent benchmark such as your treasury bill yield or your sovereign yield curve or LIBOR. You don't have to worry about those terms for the time being. Just important thing to remember is the rate can either be fixed or floating. And if it's floating, it's pegged to something that everybody can observe, right? It's not a black box um, peg. The, the interest can also be cash interest or it can be peak interest. And peak interest just means it's payable in kind, right? All of these fancy terms that Herbie and I have dreamt up, you know, they have some, some uh, method to those madness, right? So peak interest is really payment in kind interest in which the interest payment is not paid in cash, but rather by increasing the principal amount by the amount of the interest, meaning that you capitalize the interest um, or it's converted to equity or some other structure that is agreeable to both you and the mezzanine lender. And the reason for that, again, as I said, so for instance, if you have a high growth business and the MES lenders done their diligence, you have your financial model, they've looked at it, they're very satisfied with what you've presented and they believe you, more importantly, they might say, look, we will put some MES funding in, but we know that in the early stages of your business while you're getting up to speed, you can't pay all of this interest back in cash, but I still want my hurdle rate. I still want my 20 or my 25% hurdle rate. So what they will say is, okay, when we've looked at your model, what we believe that you could comfortably pay in cash might be, say, 15%, for argument's sake. The other 5%, they will either say, okay, that 5%, you will give me shares in exchange for that each year, or I will just capitalize that 5%. So instead of owing me $100, you'll owe me $105 come next year because I've capitalized $5 of that interest. And that's what we mean by payment in kind or peak interest. And the other way that MES investors get their return is by equity. 
So along with the typical interest payment associated with the debt, you do often include some structure that says, in return for giving you this mess funding, I will take an equity stake in your business in the event that you can't pay, or it might be part of the overall structure. So to get to my hurdle rate as a MES investor, I might say I want, again, 20%. I know you can't afford to pay 20% in cash. I may say, okay, you give me 10% in cash interest, and that other 10%, you will give me shares for that. Or they might say, look, I will take the entire 20% in the form of convertible shares, so that when you develop your exit strategy, which might be we sell into private equity or we do an IPO, my 10% that I have converted to equity, I will be able to sell that. And I'll, because the company would have grown, I will get the upside from that 10% that I have converted to equity. So that's another way that they do it. And very quickly, because I'm getting that signal of, of wrapping up, what are some of the uses um, for MES funding? Typically, what we see is that MES funding is used for business expansion. So for high growth companies, who have a limitation on providing hard assets to be used as collateral for tra traditional bank financing, or for companies who have exhausted their bank lines and need additional funding to maximize revenue or profit opportunities, and maybe you don't want to do an outright sale of equity at a particular point in time. So typically, those companies say, can I, get, can I avail myself of MES financing because I can afford it? My company is growing very fast. I don't want to sell the equity now because if I sell the equity, I feel I'm going to lose out because if I sell the equity in two years' time, when the company has grown to where I think it can be, my equity will be worth a lot more than if I sell it now. So MES financing has a role to play in that. In leverage buyouts, MES capital can be used in conjunction with other securities to fund the purchase price of the company being acquired. And typically it's used to fill a financing gap between less expensive forms of financing such as senior loans and high yield loans and equity and so on. And um, for real estate finance, it also has a role to play, where the MES loan can be used by developers to secure supplementary financing for development projects. And these sorts of MES loans are often secured by a second ranking on, on the real property. So they take a second mortgage, or sometimes even a third mortgage on the property. Um, but their repayment and their upside comes from the fact that when the developer would have completed that development and sold off those units, um, they get the upside from that. So they might say, look, you know, we'll come in on a third position, but the rate that we are going to charge is much higher than on a traditional bank loan, or we might charge you the same interest rate in cash, but we'll take a percentage of the profits at the back end when you'll have sold off the development. So again, MES has a, has a role to play in that. And for cash outs, that is at, you know, where we see it more often than not for cash outs where private equity firms would have invested in a company. The company is doing well. The company can now stand on its own two feet, it's generating a lot of cash. The private equity investor wants to get their cash out. They might not necessarily want to do an IPO at this point, or they might not necessarily want to sell the equity state because they believe there's more upside. What they will say is, look, we'll take some of our equity out or all of our equity out, or our cash equity that we've put in, we'll take a MES loan. And they don't mind if the MES loan is paying a much higher rate because they're getting their equity out to invest in something else. And the business continues to pay for itself. And if at the end of the day, when the business has reached the peak, then they will sell that business and take out the rest of their profit. So that's typically the kind of the four um, ways in which we see MES financing. So you know, as you've heard tonight, you know, there are many different ways to skin this cat of raising capital for your business. right? And, and what I would encourage you to do is to think about all of them each of them has a role to play. Each of them, of course, have their pros and their cons, but they're all there to help you to grow your business and get you to where you want to be. What you'd have heard as well is that there is a very robust ecosystem between banks, though not banks, you know, they have a big role to play. You have banks, you have venture capital funds, you have private equity, you have mezzanine lenders, and you have sharks. You, know, you have to decide which one of them we have angels on your sharks, right? So I'm not saying, decide which one is best for you, right? Um, we, of course, don't recommend that you use the sharks, right? We recommend that you use angels or venture capitalists or private equity or banks or, you know, you raise equity, IPOs or you use mess funding. Again, the thing to do is sit with your financial advisor. You have two of us here. You know, you have myself from JMB Cap Markets Unit. 
you have Herbert from NCB, I don't really shouldn't give him a plug, but you know, we work very closely together on a number of transactions all the time, um, because that is what partnerships do. Um, and of course, you have Sandra in the, in the venture capital space, and you have JBDC who will help you, you know, to navigate this space and, and get to where you want to go. So thank you very much for your rapt attention. I don't know if it was boredom or it was interest, but <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, a common thing, common theme among all of the types of financing that you will try to access is your preparedness. And that has to do um, with your, the, the structuring of your books. First of all, that you keep records and things of that nature. The, uh, paying tax and, and being very transparent. Um, certainly, if, per, if somebody is taking a stake in your business in the form of angel or venture or equity financing, generally speaking, um, one of the critical things that you have to understand is that you have to show that your business is uh, structured. In other words, your car, the board meetings in the bedroom or the kitchen won't work. <laughs> You know, it has to be a structured kind, ki kind of operation such that an investor will feel comfortable that this is a business that I can invest my hard-earned money in and that I will get returns. Because the investor is not there for the benevolence. Many investors like to see entrepreneurship growth and that type of thing. And that's why they're kind of wanting to use their money in that way. But they are there to make a return on their investment. So it's very important. Uh, before the question comes, uh, the questions come, I want to stress the point that angel investors are a, a different breed of financiers because they're really not just investing money in their business. Um, more important is that they are investing their time and energy as partners to get this business growing. Our interest is in the growth of this high potential business. And so we will serve on your boards. We will um, open our contact list so that you can get access to, our, to markets, to the people we know. Um, and all the angel investors in our network are prominent business people who can help you um, make connections, the kinds of connections that are going to be beneficial to your business. Very important as, um, is the whole question of governance. Um, so it is a requirement that the, the companies in which we invest have an active board of directors on which we sit. My question really is, um, I know um, the the first presenter, I believe, um, from JBDC, spoke about um, the accelerator program, right? Um, so what I want to know is, um, in that program, is there any system in place um, to help um, young entrepreneurs uh, actually uh, uh, generate sales in terms of, uh, you know, sales training and that kind of thing? You know, because I know um, once we've actually identified that, identified that um, target market, we need to actually um, come up with strategies to uh, sell to those persons. So is there any any way to to um, help, um, as I said, um, uh, sales training um, for, for, for entrepreneurs? We wouldn't start at training you in sales. We'd start at an assessment of what your, your real issues are. And we'll make that determination. And then, if we find that you have a real sales issue, then we'll prepare for a, a training program for you and invite others as well for that. But we would have to do the initial assessment to determine what the real need is. My name is Steve Kaiser from Kaiser Green Energy. Um, I've been working with the Business Development Center for quite some time, and I have to they, they are fantastic people. Um, they got me started uh, moving forward. Um, I'm finding that um, well, what I do is I take plastic bottles and I turn it into propane. And I do it very cheaply. <laughs> the thing is, um, everything hinges on a business plan. And I've been working towards this business plan. Uh, five weeks now, I've been hacking away at this business plan. My question is, once you have a business plan, what's next? The angels want to know, is this activity that you are involved in? 
yes. a potential business. Will it yes, make there is a business. profits? Yes. <laughs> How much will it make? When will it make it? What um, resources do you need to make the money? I have and all the resources yeah, in place. So yes. that's what the business plan tells us, mm -hmm. right? So yes. it's the first step because in your pitch, mm -hmm. you have to explain to us um, what is your product, mm -hmm. what's the compelling reason for getting into this business, who are your customers, who is going to buy your product, um, mm -hmm. how much are you going to sell it for, mm -hmm. how much are you going to generate in revenue, what are your expenses, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are your financial projections over a five-year period, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what sort of team do you need, who are the people do you need to employ, right? What will they cost? Um, what's your strategy to get news about this great product that you have to the marketplace? So that's why we need the business plan. And it's really mostly for you, you know, mm -hmm. because it is really going to convince you that you have a, a business that you can then sell that idea to us, right? Now, once, once we hear that, and I, I tell you, sometimes we hear pitches that we get really excited about. Um, but we need to have the fundamentals because even after the pitch and we say, oh, this looks interesting. We're going to do the deep dive and do the due diligence mm -hmm. to see all kinds of things, right? Things about you, things about, mm -hmm. um, you know, all kinds of things, the commercial aspects, the people aspects, all of those things. So if we then invest, um, we would you know, help you to assemble your team, or if you have the team already. I'm smiling um, because provide, I have all your answers. Well, to provide <laughs> you with the guidance yeah. mm -hmm. to get this business to grow. So mm -hmm. first, you have to convince us mm -hmm. that this is a business that we should invest in. And then that's what you do at the pitch. Mm -hmm. You have to come to us and make that pitch. Um, and we help you to get ready for the pitch. We do the coaching. Um, mm -hmm. You. You, we have a one-day workshop in which we go through the whole process, get you to understand what equity funding is all about, what angel investing is, um, you know, all the steps that you need to take, what happens after the investment. So we, we go through that in a one-day workshop. If you come to pitch and you get a term sheet, we do the due diligence, we have a shareholders agreement, you get the money and then you go make the money. Right? So yeah. if you are at that stage... That's this Friday? Is this it? Well, <laughs> there is a process to get to pitching. Mm -hmm. um, the people who are pitching on Friday have you know, applied a couple months ago. They've come to our workshop. They've mm. got the coaching. They're ready to go in front of the angels. I don't put anybody in front of the angels unless I'm you know, almost sure that they're going to invest. Why waste their time, right? Absolutely. So, so the first step is for you to apply mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. uh, I will actually see that application and get in touch with you. We'll do a screening pitch if it looks interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then we take it from there. So I ur urge you to apply. Yes. Firstangelsja.com. Well. Let's see where we go. But just to add to, to what Sandra is saying, um, I think even before you get to, to <laughs> wanting to pitch to First Angels, I think you have to decide first and foremost, what is it that you want? What is it that you actually need? Right? So Money. Yeah, 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 we all need money. But what do you need the money for? And that is sometimes I find some of the missteps. I don't want to call them mistakes. Some of the missteps that entrepreneurs make early in the game. So just take your example, and we're not going to go deep into it because obviously it's confidential to you, but you have an idea. You need to be like, it doesn't sound like you've built out um, that product that I don't know, and you don't have to answer at this point. So one of the things you want to do, for instance, is it that you should get enough money to build a prototype of whatever this machine is, Mm -hmm. so that you can actually test it 
You can evidence demand for the thing so that when you go to pitch, you can say, look, I've gotten some money from my three Fs. I don't want to say the four, mm -hmm. right? It was the founders, family, the friends. You know, we don't, don't want the fool just yet. Um, and I've built a prototype. The thing works. Yes, I does. know I have some demand. You might not have demand for the entire Jamaica, but you could say, look, we've tested this thing with housewives in, I don't know, <laughs> wherever, right? And the initial response is, so that when, when you're making that pitch, the angels or the investors can feel fairly comfortable that this is something that actually works. Because one of the last things you want to do is to say, you know, I have this wonderful idea to build this fancy thing, and I think if I get $100,000, I'm going to do this and it's going to work. And everyone will say, all right, sure. Because, you know, we don't have anything better to do than $100,000 than to put in something that you think might or might not work. It does. No, no, I'm not saying that you're <laughs> in that position. Yes. I'm just saying it in general. Yes, in general, right. Right? right. So, and I think that is why that both Sandra and Audrey mentioned mm. the four Fs. I'm cutting back to three. Right? You want to get some of that money in to do some of the initial stuff. What it also demonstrates to them is a commitment to say, I am risking my own hard-earned money. I have skin in the game, as Sandra said. So those things are also important. But I think more important is that you have to decide what it is do I need to move my business from point A to point B. So you might have a grand design, and nothing is wrong with that. You might want to cover the entire Jamaica, possibly the Caribbean, maybe the globe, and that is fine. Save but, the world. But, but is that the amount of money you need today? The amount of money you need today might be just to cover New Kingston. And building expenses. And you start from there. So again, as entrepreneurs, you have to think, right? Mm -hmm. This thing goes in stages, which is why I think we've all mentioned tonight that there is a business life cycle. So you have angel investors, you have venture capitalists, you have mess financiers, you have banks, you have private equity, and then you have the general market. Each of those various facets of the ecosystem serves a particular purpose, and that is why they're there. So angel investors will only invest up to a certain amount because that is their risk tolerance. They really can't go more than that because their exit is for the next person to take them out. And that next person has an exit strategy for the person above them to take them out. So you, you have to be mindful of these things. So when you're putting your business plan together, try to get as granular as possible. What it is do I need now to achieve what it is that I said I want to achieve? And you don't need to be saving the world today. You can save the world in 10 years. Make sure that you understand what instrument you need right now, what product you need right now mm -hmm. to move from where you are to the next step. Find out and, and, and understand that the business plan, plan needs to take that into account as well, right? Um, <coughs> I, hear, I hear you call in terms of saving the world. Uh, that might be, a, that might be a, a goal for next year. But understand what you need to do to do the next mm -hmm. step. And that is part of the reasons why we're having this session this evening, for you to begin to understand what the products are, what are the options, that, that, and, and begin as entrepreneurs to look at these options in a real kind of way as options for solutions in my business and how it is that you then now need to fashion your pitch in your business plan towards that. Yeah.